Hi, I'm James and welcome to another review. Today we're going to look at Warlord Games Bolt Action book, Campaign Sea Lion. Now, really I should have reviewed this a while back because I've already reviewed the sequel, Campaign Gigant, which is a second front for Sea Lion. But I didn't have it at the time, uh, I now have it, so let's see what we've got. We've got 128 pages, which is a lot of information, uh, predominantly aimed at Bolt Action, but the background and scenarios would be usable by any system. So we've got the timeline which has to make a couple of changes because obviously there was no Operation Sea Lion launched. Um, the big difference we have is Halifax becomes Prime Minister instead of Churchill and it sort of carries on through there. Now Churchill was quite ruthless in reality um, and ordered the French fleet at Mirza Kabir destroyed. Um, it's been decided that by Halifax not to do that and as a result the French Navy is available to the Germans. So Churchill then comes to power replace, replacing Halifax um, and that basically gives us our starting point. We've got a stronger German Navy so the Kriegsmarine have got more potential to cross the channel. We have a couple of pages on the actual plan uh, and a history. We, we have um, landings uh, in Kent and further down the course towards Rye, Hastings, Bexhill and a place that some people, particularly in Britain, are likely to have heard of, Warmington-on-Sea, a nice little fictional town. And we'll come back and talk about those a bit later on. So. We get the, the background as to what's going off. Uh, it doesn't go according to plan. There's a lot of things go wrong, which is a nice touch. Uh, particularly like the little tiny touch about the German uh, invasion barges that get lost and manage a perfect landing and attack in Belgium. That has to be worth gaming out. It's a, it's actually gives you an excuse, I suppose, to actually use a German force against a German force if you both turn up with German armies. Just um, we've got the usual illustrations, we've got all the ones pulled from uh, Osprey books and some beautiful painted pictures of miniatures, uh, start again, beautiful uh, miniatures that have been painted put to perfection. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll put a couple of pictures up so you can see what I mean. We've got some new theatre selectors, we've got a British regular army reinforced tank platoon, um, obviously a tank platoon early war isn't going to be particularly strong. Um, you've got a few different options. You could, I mean, if you offer Matilda 2s, it's going to be pretty tough. Uh, but you can actually have it composed of universal carriers. So you can actually turn that almost into a scouting unit, which is, you know, it's, it's an option. We've then got a regular army infantry reinforced platoon. That's fairly straightforward. Um, you've then got a nice little touch, you've got British Arm, Regular Army Anti-Parachutist Light Infantry Patrol, uh, which has been uh, based around the information they pulled from 7th Lincolnshire Regiment, which was based around Nottingham in July 1940. Uh, now this is intended as a patrol level game. This book introduces patrols, which are basically 500 point battles. Uh, and to be honest, I'd rather game in that. I think that works nicely in this scale. So. There's not a lot of option within that. For example, you've got the, the lieutenant and two regular infantry sections. Um, you've then got the option of the headquarters, where you can have an officer and a medic, and the infantry, which is not to four infantry sections and not to one tank hunting infantry sections, and that's it. So it does give you a few options in that you can ha add a few um, transport vehicles and things like that. Bicycles are in there. So yeah, there's a, there's a few little bits in there. Uh, you've then got British Army Coastal Defence Reinforced Platoon, so quite a nice one. Uh, you've got a standard option. You can alternatively start putting a Home Guard in. Uh, you can add Royal Navy to it, so there are some nice little, little touches with that one. Uh, British Army Airfield Defence Reinforced Platoon. Now this is pre the formation of the RAF Regiment, um, so it basically lets you have... Um, an air, air, airfield defence force, which predominantly at this point were TA. 
Um, now interestingly it includes the cockatrice which I'll mention later on but I always love that vehicle if for nothing else than the fact it's a flame throwing anti-aircraft weapon. Yeah. I'll say that again. A flame throwing anti-aircraft weapon. I have my doubts about that but Fairfield Defence I can see it being quite useful. We then come on to the local defence volunteer patrol reinforced platoons. Now these are the forerunners of the Home Guard, the LDV were the predecessors, and we've got an urban militia, um, you've got a, a shire one, so basically a countryside one, and a water patrol one, so you can actually have watercraft. They've all got their own little advantages and disadvantages, and you've also got the Women's Federation Toxophilite Club Patrol. Basically a lot of these are armed with long bows, sporting bows, and they've now taken up arms. Okay, um, it's different, but I probably wouldn't game them, but I do like the concept. We've then got the Home Guard reinforced platoon, and it sort of emphasises the difference between the LDV um, and the Home Guard was the Home Guard was better equipped, that's basically how they've done it. Um, the LDV, or Look, Duck and Vanish, was what was, was jokingly referred to as, uh, they were very much armed with whatever you can get your hands on. You're talking the broom handles with a carving knife attached, shotguns, blunderbusses. Uh, if you're a Dad's Army fan, Lance Corporal Jones is Asagai. Um, it's that level of equipment, whereas the Home Guard is better equipped, often admittedly with American donation weapons like the P-14 rifle, which you see in Dad's Army, and a lot of people miss the fact that uh, in that they, they weren't armed with the 303. Uh, we then come on to new units. We've got um, Royal Navy officers and sections. Okay, yeah, I like that. I probably would have just treated them personally as ordinary infantry and replaced the Bren with a Lewis gun, possibly. Um, but yeah, um, I must find someone who makes figures with a Lanchester model because that that would be lovely for that. You've then got the LDV units, so you've got the different types of leader, one for each type, and the different patrols. Um, also amusingly there's a Boy Scout patrol uh, and I've actually picked up a few of First Corps Boy Scouts um, just just because I could. Um, you've then got um, things like veteran versions of that because there were an awful lot of old second, also old First World War veterans serving. The obvious example is a certain Lance Corporal Fuller who goes on to head up 79th Armoured Division he was, I believe, a colonel in the First World War. Uh, at this point, he's actually a lance corporal. Um, there's a great reference in the early episodes of Dad's Army, guess which army I'm building up at the minute, um, to Corporal Colonel Square, who's a colonel uh, in the First World War, but is now serving as a corporal. Um, we then get the Home Guard units, uh, and you've got a nice division where you've got some ordinary ones, and then you've got old soldiers. Um, and a Legends of Britain, the Warmington on Sea LDV Stroke Home Guard Platoon. I love it. It had to be in there. Um, awfully, as I hate to say it, I think the research was slightly missing on it. Uh, it refers to the fact that it's really a section. Well, actually, if you watch the series, the patrol strength varies. Um, they actually have 15 plus the two um, senior figures. So actually that's, that's justifiable as an actual reinforced platoon. Um, they actually go up to 23 it refers to in one episode, but when you count the numbers on parade, there's almost invariably 15 in the ranks and Wilson and Mannering uh, at the front. So I'm going to rewrite that. When I do get that done, I'll put, I will uh, upload that to um, my website. You've also got Vickers guns, uh, anti-tank teams. You get the auxiliary units. Um, now these are fascinating. You had people like Peter Fleming, Ian Fleming's brother in it. Uh, Anthony Quayle, the actor, was a member of this. And if you regard this as basically a special forces unit, stay behind troops, um, everyone sort of regards them as part of the Home Guard. And they were attached to it mainly as a cover because then they had an excuse to be out and about um, doing it. So we've got sniper teams and sabotage teams uh, and you can also have an SAS agent yeah there's some nice ones in there 
Uh, obsolete artillery, we've got things like emplaced coastal guns, Hotchkiss six pounder, now that's not the six pounder of later um, fame, it's actually the tank gun from the First World War, which was actually a converted naval gun. We've got the, the Smith gun. Um, now the Smith gun wasn't issued until 1942, but it notes it could have been from 1940, so they included it. The Northover projector, similar comet, but that's from 1941. Um, and then improvised artillery, they've got two 14-inch guns called Winnie and Pooh, um, after Christopher Robin um, and A.A. Milne. Now these are massive guns and are probably better as, a, as a, it notes as a objective rather than an actual unit. We've got some new vehicles. Uh, you've got the medium Mark C Hornet, the Vickers medium Mark 1 and 2, the TOG 1. If you've ever been to Bovington to the Tank Museum, uh, TOG 1 is absolutely massive. Uh, TOG stands for the Old Guard who are the um, people who designed the First World War tanks. They were designing a tank in the Second World War using the First World War ideas. It, it, was, it was a horrible design, didn't work, um, but hey, it's a nice addition. Um, you got then motorcycle with a, um, a Northwood projector, various other mobile anti-tank guns. Um, some of these struggle to actually be called armoured vehicles. Um, You've even got a motorised Tachanka, uh, which is based on the Russian um, Black Guards sort of carts with a rear firing machine gun. If I describe it as a World War II technical, that would basically sum it up. Um, and you've got various armoured cars, quite a few of them, because at this point we were, we were basically making absolutely anything. If you could make it, it went in. Um, so there's quite a few different ones there. Um, plus, of course, you then get things like civilian goods delivery vans, uh, civilian lorries, a civilian bus. Now that that was a, that was a lovely little uh, touch. I like the Ironside, which was special saloons built for people like the royal family, cabinet ministers, and senior staff officers. And as soon as I saw that, all I thought was, "Here comes the eagle has landed." It, it just has to be done. Now you get boats. Yeah, and then the great Panjandrum. Um, all I'll say is research it. It's the most bizarre thing ever. It does even turn up in an episode of Dad's Army um, with a lovely fictional high-tech uh, radio-controlled version. So we then come on to new British weapons. So we have in there things like the shotgun. We've okay, we've seen that a few times before, but it also adds the blunderbuss in. Yeah, uh, we've got improvised hand weapons. We've got the Lewis gun, always one of my favourites. Um, I've actually bought a couple of figures from First Corps with the Lewis gun. Uh, I'll, I'll put a link. I remember I'll put a link up in the, the top there again. Um, if you do want to know more about the Lewis, I'd seriously recommend Neil Grant's Osprey Weapons book on the Lewis gun. It, it's got some very good information in there. Uh, we've got longbows, and for all the Lindy Beige fans out there, I'm afraid you've also got rules for fire arrows. Anti-tank rifle grenades, then we've got all the various artillery. Then we have a section on armoured trains. Now, armoured trains are a strange thing. Um, you actually have um, ordinary trains and we also have armoured trains, gun wagons and a light railway armoured train because the, the Romney Hyde and Dimchurch Light Railway actually had, had a special armoured train. It's quite a famous one. Um, you know, a lot of these things in here are not going to be common um, even in campaign games but there's a couple that you just think I'm going to have to use these. Then we come on to fortifications and, well, they're all the usual things you'd expect like pillboxes, dragon's teeth, things like that. And then we come to the 1940 bits. The Pickett Hamilton Disappearing Pillbox. This is a pop-up pillbox designed for airfields um, and basically it was lowered so it was flushed to the ground when you didn't need it, which is quite useful on an airfield. Um, 
Yeah, they're not perfect. Um, it comments that the big problem was they often acted as a drainage area. Um, but they're so bizarre, I just like them. And, you know, I'm probably going to have to look at that. We've also got the Bison Armoured Lorry. Yes, that is in the fortification section. Because it basically is made of concrete. And stops in position. Designed for airfield defence. It was a typical example. It was somebody who actually went out and did this off his own back and built 24 of them. Um, and it was described as a semi-mobile concrete pillbox. <sighs> yeah. Um, I wouldn't have liked to have been in one of those, if I'm honest. You've obviously got all the usual bits as well with that. Um, flame fugas. Something I wasn't aware of was in 1940, we, Britain had lots and lots of oil. Um, so there was a big move to actually use that um, as what we would call these days an IED. So, yeah, that, that was interesting a little bit. Uh, we've got the minefield rules, all the usual uh, bits with that. Re you know, we, we're seeing some of these in a lot of books. I'm kind of guessing third edition will pull a lot of these rules in. Um, we then get to the German invasion forces. So theatre selectors, we've got a beach landing reinforced platoon, which has to be taken with uh, water transport if you're using it for a landing, fairly obviously. That's quite a nice little list. It's probably not that different from a standard list. I've not really looked into it. Uh, we've got a Foschme Jäger reinforced platoon. Now that I do like. I've just picked up two boxes of Foschme Jäger um, and I'm working on the fact that I can use 30 of them as early war with the Type 1 smocks. So yeah, I'm probably going to have a go at building that. Um, yeah, it look, looks a fairly typical sort of unit and it's nice to see where they're actually getting their own list rather than just being um, part of it a standard army. Now you've got the Brandenburgers, these are basically the special forces um, of the Germans. They were never really big on special forces, the Germans, um, so we actually have um, details of that. And yeah, it's probably more a patrol scenario one or an ally unit. Uh, Airborne Raiders Reinforced Platoon, um, very similar to the Falschme Jäger, um, but these are coming in in gliders. That would also be useful for things like Eben Imal, things things like that. Uh, fifth Column Reinforced Platoons. Fifth Columnists were a big worry at the time. Um, so you've got the British Union of Fascists Reinforced Platoon. Um, yeah, the black shirts basically. Um, We've got that, again I'd probably look at that more for a patrol one. Uh, we've got a gangster reinforced platoon. Uh, sort of, these are the people who are going to do anything for money. Um, I'm not entirely sure of them as a list, but yeah, I suppose it's something a little, little different. Uh, details of statistics for Oswald Mosley, which just feels a bit weird. Um, you then got the new German units, you've got the Brandenburgers, um, quite a few of those, complete with Abre agents. Um, fifth column units, uh, some nice ones in there, you've got things like the um, where is it? The gang members, I believe you've also got a group of hangers on, which are small town criminals, uh, young would be gangsters, um, they're sort of, we got a less effective version of the gang basically, they're inexperienced as opposed to regular. You then got some German invasion equipment, you've got invasion barges and all the different um, transport. We have a couple of amphibious tanks, uh, one of which floats, one of which drives along the seabed. Yeah, I wouldn't want to be in one of them. Um, you've got the DFS-230 Assault Glider. Now that, that's a useful for one to use. Um, and you've also got details of the shape charge demolitions explosives. Um, the interesting thing I hadn't realised is they didn't have the cone lining that I always assumed that they'd had, um, so they weren't as effective on penetrating armour. So at new special rules, we've got two pages of them. Um, I think if I pick a couple of these it will give you an idea of the sort of things we're talking about. Um, you've got things like clumsy handling. So this is the chance, this is a vehicle which has got a chance to turn over if you give it a run order. Uh, dangerous. If you roll one, we're rolling to hit, roll the dice again. On a second one, the gun explodes, killing the crew. Uh, we've got the longbow. We've got... I still, still can't believe this is in there. Roller skates. 
so we've actually got um, rules for that. Shortage of ammunition, that's probably quite a sensible one. Uh, tricky to aim. And having had, had the, the clumsy one, we've now got very clumsy handling. This might well be the armoured uh, concrete pillbox on wheels. Uh, can't be given a run order, may only be driven over flat clear ground. Roll before each move. On a one, it falls over and is wrecked. Two, the overload transmission fails and it's immobilised. And on three plus, it moves off sedately. I like that one. Uh, we then get the scenarios. There are um, some scenarios. We've got a Brandenburger coastal raid. Now that's quite a nice one because that will work the other way around as well. If you've got some special forces, commandos, paratroops, that'll work, that would work really well. Uh, a standard beach landing one on the beaches of Kent, so you've actually got the, um, the landing. Raiding His Majesty's Armoury, this is almost straight out of a Dad's Army episode. You have the local home guard commander um, has been uh, is visiting his mistress and he's got the keys to the armoury so both sides are racing to try and get them. I like that one as a scenario. Um, I do get a distinct feeling that that could even turn into Sir Henry Willoughby if you're a fan of um, The Eagle Has Landed. That one works quite nicely. We've got an airfield assault, always a useful scenario to have. Um, another patrol scenario, because some of these are patrol, some are for battles. Luftwaffe down, uh, where it all revolves around recovering some, a canister uh, a film from a shot down aircrew. Um, it's a chance to use those foundry Luftwaffe aircrew, um, one of whom has got a machine gun. I think this might even be written with a pack in mind. Uh, we've got a battle scenario to capture a port, a uh, patrol scenario to take out a roadblock, which does sort of set, point out it could easily be built up to a full battle scenario, that one. Uh, we've got a hedgehog, this is all part of the British defensive doctrine where they used hedgehogs, basically an armoured position, and the idea is that position uh, is held uh, and it's then counter-attack to, to relieve it. Uh, not a nice little scenario. And then we've got my favourite patrol scenario, by far, Kill Churchill. Yeah, I've got a CP model um, Churchill figure which fits this beautifully. Um, basically we have... Um, Churchill at um, home in Chartwell, out in the grounds painting, and then we have the German assault. Bit of the eagle has landed really. Uh, and you've also got the statistics for Winston Churchill at 185 points. Base cost. Yeah, he's he's not your Chuck Norris type one, but he, he's a very, very inspirational leader. Um, the Germans get more points for capturing him and killing him, which is a nice touch. And then you've got um, the battle scenario, the Filthy Fifth, which is basically the Royal Tank Regiment, and it's basically uh, an armoured battle. You've then got the campaign, so it basically ties the scenarios together and gives you um, basically a chance to decide how you've done overall by comparing the scenarios. And then there's a little bit at the end which talks about why didn't he come, um, which is a nice little touch. It talks about the reality as opposed to the, um, the fiction. So, nice book, lots of good things in it. Um, it's I've never played Early War, really, and this has inspired me to, between this and Guy Gant. I, I think they're lovely books. Um, I've gone back and looked at, sort of looked at um, what we can do. There's a few things that I would seriously recommend um, to use to get your head around it. Um, on YouTube, you can find a copy of Went the Day Well, which was written by Graham Greene and filmed during the Second World War, and would make a great scenario. Um, in fact, I'm probably actually going to write it up at some point. It'll probably take me a while to do it, but I think that's a, a brilliant scenario for this. Uh, you can even turn it into a mini campaign. You've also got... Um, the Eagle has landed. It's a bit past this in the timeline, but easy to transpose. And in fact, with the capturing Churchill scenario, you've pretty much got it made for you. Um, so we've got that. You've got the film Dunkirk. Not the 2017 one, but the previous black and white one. I think that's well worth a look, because it really will give you um, a good insight into 
how things were at the time. Uh, I, I think that, that that's well worth a look. So they might start you. Um, and then obviously TV series and now two spin-off films, Dad's Army. Um, everybody always sees it as a very much a comedy. Anybody who thinks that, I would say to them, look at it again. The Battle of Godfrey's Cottage, which an episode we thought was lost for many years and is now we've now got a copy. It actually makes the point that these people basically were expecting to die if there was a German invasion. They were going to give their lives. And you get the characters in Dad's Army, who we all love and joke about, but all of a sudden they're deadly serious. So I would actually recommend particularly that episode. Um, it also gives you a nice scenario if you want a blue on blue game. But it's a brilliant source for building up a Dead's Army Force. And what I will probably do at some point is I'm building a Dead's Army Force. I'll actually do a couple of um, articles about it. And you may find them useful, you may not, that's entirely up to you, you know. But it's a period which I've suddenly realised is so full of potential and it's not super heavy tanks. It's much more infantry based. So I'm I'm a, I'm a convert to early war in, in 28mm um, and no doubt I'll be looking at more bits and pieces to do with that in the coming months. I hope that was useful for you and I'll see you soon for another review.